Hey there, gentlemen and ladies. This is the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. I have an amazing passion for helping people. I have an incredible desire to live a long, healthy, vigorous, rigorous life. And I hope you do too. And if living a long, strong, healthy life is part of your mission, you're going to absolutely love this podcast today. And I hope every week uh, we go out of our way to find the world's greatest guests to bring you the best information on everything cutting edge to live your greatest life in a body you love. And today I feel incredibly blessed to be joined by Dr. David Sinclair. He's recently finished a book called Lifespan, really starting to dissect why we age and how ultimately we can prevent, perhaps reverse, but ultimately optimize the quality of every minute we get to spend on this rock. And it was a truly, truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to interview Dr. Sinclair. Many of you know him famously from being on the Joe Rogan podcast and really everywhere around the world. He's the gentleman who's responsible for NAD or NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which has been shown to be one of the best longevity supplements that exists. He's the man who pioneered the resveratrol research He's behind so many amazing research studies out of the University of Harvard in Massachusetts and went out of his way to make time to talk to us today, to spread his incredible wisdom and his message. And he's actually got some very new revelations within this podcast. I've read a lot of what Dr. Sinclair has put out. I've read his book. I've read many of his studies. And some of the things he says in here today are new. So even though you may be very familiar with Dr. Sinclair, there's definitely some new things here. If you're not, you're going to be pleasantly surprised with his ability to get into the weeds around some action items that we need to all be taking to live our greatest life. And as I said, an absolute pleasure. This podcast is brought to you today by Bubs Naturals. I care about what goes into my body, as should you. I'm borderline neurotic about the quality of the food that goes into me. And certainly, it's not to the point that I'm going to stress about things. If I can't access food, I'm not going to stress about it. But when I can, I absolutely invest in the best. And Bub's Naturals is by far the best collagen and by far the best MCT powder I've ever come across. And they stick with those two simple products and they do it better than everybody else. And I encourage you to try it and I encourage you to see if you can compare them against something else and why I think everyone should take collagen. Anyone who consumes a high amount of animal protein, obviously muscle meat is what we used to. There's many amino acids that are perhaps out of ratio. Uh, We should be consuming certain ratios that exist more so in the tendons and the ligaments that, you know, historically would have eaten as cavemen and and as humans, but we don't because it's been removed from our diet and you have to supplement with this stuff. If you're not, you're absolutely going to start compromising your gut health, your insulin sensitivity, your detoxification pathways, and your hair, your skin, your nails. Most people know that, but most people don't think about it. So I suggest you head over to bubsnaturals.com and use the code intelligence, I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-E-N-C-E, intelligence, to get an incredible discount off of Bubs. They're going to give you 20% off your first order. And here's what I love about Bubs, why they're amazing on top of the best quality. They're also going to contribute a massive chunk of their profit to charity which as we all know, giving back is a big, big part of how we can make this world a better place. So thank you so much to Bubs for sponsoring the podcast and I hope each and every one of you gets over, jumps on this amazing deal to try what I would say is the best collagen and MCT that exists in the world right now and add that to your coffee in the morning and life is just better. Enjoy my conversation with Dr. David Sinclair. Take lots of notes. Let me know if you loved it. I'd love to hear your opinions and please do share on social media what you think about it. If there's any questions for me or Dr. Sinclair, he definitely is very active on social media, on Instagram, and I'm sure he would appreciate a shout out. Have an amazing day, guys. Enjoy the podcast.
So as we just continue our conversation, just talking about this reptilian brain, always kind of having the need to be satisfied. There's some thought around this reality that the world is designed that way. You know, the TVs are designed to keep you in fear. The way societies are built, it's designed to keep you in fear. So you have this unconscious need to mute the fear, you know, ultimately driving consumerism, right? If we're always in fear and anxiety and stress, your body's always going to give you these primal urges to, you know, feed, relax, overcome anxiety, maybe to take medications, not certainly be motivated to do anything productive for yourself. Right. I think we've all experienced a fair amount of stress in our lives. Modern life is, is still pretty stressful. My reaction to it is like a lot of people. Uh, I don't like to go to the gym when I'm totally stressed out, but I like to sit down, watch a movie, completely veg out and, uh, and eat snacks because it makes me feel better. I try not to because those urges are you know, great in the short run, but very bad for us in the long run. And uh, consumerism, whether it's buying goods and you know, putting them in your basement or your wardrobe, if you like uh, buying excess clothes, it's also important to realize that food is just as much consumerism and, and big multinational companies. They're all about making sure that you cannot stop eating once once you start. And you know the perfect mix of of fat and salt and and uh, acidity triggers that reptilian brain. We love to eat it. We love to also relax and sit down rather than getting on a treadmill. I'm uh, sitting in a comfy chair a few feet away from the treadmill that's in my gym next door. And yeah, it's much easier to sit around, watch movies, eat sweet and salty popcorn. But that's what's killing us because our bodies uh, physically get just as lazy. So we have these inbuilt survival networks in our body. Some of the genes that control these networks we refer to as longevity genes for the simple reason that if you turn them on, animals in the lab typically live longer. But these genes don't get turned on unless they're freaked out, unless they're needed. And what turns them on is not popcorn and it's not movies. It's getting out of the chair. It's being hungry, experiencing adversity because they've evolved to keep us alive when times are getting tough. But our lives these days are very rarely tough. So they just uh, they sit around and conserve energy. Yeah, I often say we're probably the weakest version of the human species that's ever lived. And uh, I mean, just nothing in our life is challenging. It's designed that way, right? Everything's meant to make life easier, which is wonderful on one end. And the other end is your brain's always going to choose that, especially when it's in fear and anxiety and depression and your body's craving that comfort. And, you know, speaking of consumerism, it, my thought is it's it's curated from the time you're born, right? I don't, David, I don't have kids, but the second your children are born, you're told as a parent, you need to feed this child every two hours for the rest of their life or they're going to die. And you're going to be a bad parent. I'm sure that makes sense for the first six to 12 months of their life. But beyond that, it's certainly not necessary. But now they're in the habit of, I need to eat breakfast. I need to eat a snack. I need to have lunch. I need to have a snack. I need to have dinner. I need to have snacks. And I'm consuming six times a day and just kind of perpetuating this never ending loop of being a consumer. And that's such an interesting paradigm, right? Is, you know, we're being inbred into that so that we drive economy. And it makes sense. You don't want the economy to slow down. But at the same time, it's certainly not helping anybody live a healthy, virile life. And, uh, you know, the other end of that is the exercise piece. And there's been some really, really interesting data put forward lately about kind of the evolutionary advantage of people who would exercise. You know, after six weeks, it's been suggested your brain would change for long term and receive much more joy and fulfillment and ultimately uh, happiness from exercise because there's a this whole neurochemical cascade we're very familiar with, well, obviously the endorphins and uh, an endomide being secreted that allows you to love exercise. And you think, you understand how that would be rewarded evolutionarily, right? Someone who moves and walks and runs evolutionarily should be rewarded to procreate and live longer. And someone who doesn't, you know, if you're not walking and running evolutionarily, you're probably someone who should be dying, you know, or you're getting toward that age. And I think People should start to acknowledge that when it comes to looking at longevity is the necessity of these pieces and, and learning to control your conscious mind. Yeah, the, the control is the hard part because we're constantly fighting what we revert to as a default. So, f for example, when you fly, what you get constantly is, do you want the nuts? Do you want the food? Here, have especially if you're in business class, that, that all they want to do is give you food. And it's very hard because you're fairly bored out of your mind after a while. 
Ben, you're about to go down to Australia. You'll experience this pretty soon. It's very hard to say no thanks. And after the third time they give you a weird look, you'll give in and, and start eating it. And it's, it, you've got to be fighting and constantly thinking, what do I want to achieve? What do I want to look like tomorrow? What do I want to look like a week from now? So that, that helps me is to focus on goals. And that allows me to say no to the the simplest way in that case, David, is you know one thing I do for myself is I create rules, right? I don't eat. It's like saying I don't drink alcohol or I don't smoke. And it's so much easier when you have these concrete rules with yourself. You can say like, yeah, I don't eat on I don't eat on airplanes or I don't eat airplane food or you know, I don't eat food, low quality food, right? If you set this this standard of I only eat organic foods, well, I guess you're either bringing your food or you're not eating on an airplane. Like, like listen, I'm not perfect. Sometimes there's a time where I'll grab the bag of almonds on the airplane, but you know most often it's this, this desire to say. I only consume the highest quality foods. And if you do that, it's much easier for your, you know, you're not really playing with willpower at that point. It's just who you are and what you do. And and that comes down to the identity piece. Yeah, hundred percent. So there's very few people who are able to control themselves and have rules that they stick to. One of the rules that I've become proud of is at 40, I'm now 50 at 40. I said, no more desserts. And and I'd say that to people and they look at me like, are you crazy? How can your life be worth living if you don't eat desserts? Now, it doesn't mean that I never taste anything sweet. Occasionally I steal a little taste of dessert and that's all I need. I don't like the feeling of having huge amounts of sugar in my body anyway. And actually getting back to what you said earlier, Ben, which was about exercise, allowing you to get used to it and eventually feeling pleasure from it. The same is actually true for not eating three meals a day. I've increasingly reduced the amount of food that I'm eating, but also the frequency. I've always avoided breakfast as much as I could. I don't I don't like it. But similarly with, with lunch, I try to eat late or nothing at all. The first time you do that, your brain goes crazy. It's, oh, I, I have to eat lunch. I'm going to be hungry. I can feel it. My stomach is churning. I can't think. But if you do it for a couple of weeks, I found you actually prefer it. And so you can get used to, to really anything. I feel a lot healthier and better and focused on my current diet than I used to. That's awesome. And I totally agree, right? Your body, your brain and your body become so effective and efficient when you learn to not eat. It's almost addictive. I think, you know, this idea of one meal a day is very, very popular right now. And although I don't maybe think it's the best idea uh, in perpetuity for some people, because, you know, you find people eating these massive meals, you know, <laughs> at four or 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And I don't think that's maybe the healthiest way to optimize inflammation, LPS and digestion. But I think it's certainly a great way to feel awesome. And if you really want to drastically decrease your calories, it's probably a good idea. So that kind of sends me on a path, David, of looking at this protein piece of, of longevity, right? So there's a lot of talk around mTOR and AMPK balancing and minimizing mTOR and how that's necessary for optimizing longevity. However, there's also the conversation that says, well, many people in old age are going to die of sarcopenia and not having enough muscle and, and how much protein do we actually need to consume to maintain this muscle. My demographic definitely obviously wants to look great, wants to feel great, wants to have great sex into old age. You know, we want to have a good amount of muscle. So I think we're always kind of towing the line of, well, how much protein can I consume? How much protein should I consume? And how often should I not be eating? I'd love to have you just start off giving us some advice there. Right. So the disclaimer here is that if, if somebody's telling you they know what the best diet is for you, they're lying. I know it's not as satisfying. Everybody that I talk to wants to say, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. But first of all, just consider we are all different ages. We're different demographic. We're different races. We have different microbiomes in our gut. And we certainly have different professions. You know, I make my living using the muscle between my ears. But And it's evolving. One of the things that I'm learning is that the ability of the body to build muscle while living a long time is challenging to get that right. And not only is it hard to get the right balance of exercise plus protein, but the supplements and the, the drug, for instance, metformin, which we can delve into a bit more, it's the diabetes drug, and resveratrol is a, is a supplement that I've worked on, uh, the molecule from red wine. These supplements and the drug, they actually have some slightly negative effects on muscle building. And you might expect that because we discovered them, right? at least in the case of resveratrol, we discovered it as a mimetic, a copy of exercise and fasting. So they, they naturally uh, work through pathways that can actually mess with, with normal exercise. 
So what do I think? I mean, let me just cut to the chase. What I'm, what I'm trying to figure out, what we're all really trying to figure out is how to get the best bang for the buck. Here's what I think as, a, as, as someone who has read and researched a lot. When you're young, let's say you're in your 20s, you already have a very highly active longevity pathways. As long as you're not hugely obese and sedentary, I don't think you need to worry so much about, say, taking resveratrol or metformin, the drug. Like I did when I was in my 20s, I exercised a lot. I worked out quite a lot and felt great. I got into my 30s. My metabolism was slowing down. I started to feel a little older and I started to change my lifestyle. I wasn't so much interested in in bulking up. I was more interested or increasingly interested in in long-term preservation of my body because my body was doing a less efficient job at that. So I started changing my diet from pretty much eat whenever I wanted and whatever I wanted, you know, in a healthy way to starting to take resveratrol and focus more on on muscle building uh, than anything else. And I've continued to to do that as I've gotten older. My father is now 80, so let's fast forward now to my future and, and probably most of our futures. My father is taking metformin, taking resveratrol. So what does he do? Well, he's still eating protein, but he doesn't eat it as often. He fasts probably most days, one or two meals. But here's, here's what's important. He's gone back to the gym in, late in his life to build muscle. And so he is stronger than me at weightlifting at 80. And that's because at three days a week, he's spending a couple of hours in the gym. So lesson one is, depending on the time of your life, your age, and how you feel, you can change it, right? I think younger is not as important to worry about longevity, but the older you get, the more you have to start thinking about these things, fasting, supplementing. But to offset all of that, you don't want to lose your muscle, like you said, Ben. And so you can actually compensate like my father has by working out quite a lot to preserve and, and actually build muscle mass. He's got pretty big muscles for an 80-year-old. Uh, he also stretches a lot. He does Pilates. And so he recently fell over in, at the gym when he, we were working out together. It was in the, in the on a slippery floor after working out. I think a typical 80-year-old, that would have been the end of them. He broke his wrist. He banged his head. Instead, what happened was he recovered pretty quickly. He didn't even realize his arm was broken till a couple of weeks later when he had an x-ray. And his grip strength is so good, he's at least twice as strong as people his age typically are, that they didn't even bother doing surgery or putting a plate in. So the, that's the second point, which is you absolutely have to maintain flexibility and muscle and bone strength the older you get. Now, the third thing, this is where it gets complicated. Let's say you're my age, you're 50, okay? You're starting to worry about longevity severely, but you're also, you don't want to lose too much muscle mass. I'm losing right now probably as an average male, a few percent per year of muscle mass. That's horrific, right? That By the time I reach 80, I, I could be done for. It's probably not helped by me taking metformin and resveratrol, which as I mentioned earlier, seem to counteract muscle growth. So what do I do? Okay, I'm not recommending anything, but what I'm trying to achieve is muscle and longevity. So what do I do? I go to the gym at least once a week. I try to go three times a week if I can. On the days that I'm working out, I don't take metformin and I try to avoid resveratrol. On the days that I'm not working out, I'm fasting and I'm taking supplements. And so the bottom line is, I think the best way to optimize the body is to, is to alternate. We know that the body gets used to things, but it likes the shock of new things, temperature, being hungry, being fed. And so I think it's also going to turn out to be the case that you want to alternate between doing exercise and then on off days doing these other things. Now, it's, it's an issue if you want to be a professional bodybuilder or look great for the opposite sex and you want to work out every day. Uh, there, I think you shouldn't worry anyway, because the effects of these molecules that I take is really quite low and the muscles are just as strong. As far as the number of you know levers we have, all these different kind of seven variables of aging, where does mTOR fall in your belief in the necessity of 
optimizing longevity. So obviously we have all these different pathways like fasting. We have, you know, like you said, cold exposure and uh, you know, looking at the sirtuins, et cetera. Would mTOR be one of the biggest levers in your eyes in uh, with respect to longevity? So should my audience be very, very concerned with overconsumption of protein? Is it that big of a concern or is it maybe one of the lesser Im- influences on ultimate mortality? Mm. It's a well-recognized fact that in experiments in animals, uh, decreasing mTOR activity, which means having a lesser intake of protein or taking the drug rapamycin, greatly extends lifespan. In fact, it's it's the most robust way to extend lifespan besides intermittent feeding and caloric restriction. So yeah, I mean, scientifically, yeah, mTOR is, is king. It's central to longevity, but it's not the only way to longevity. And it's not clear whether you need to consistently have it inhibited, right? I've just said that switching things up still can work. So what are, what am I saying here? I, I think that if you're totally a carnivore, I hate to say it, and I know some people will get angry because they really believe in meat, but I haven't seen any evidence in animals or in human populations around the planet that meat eating extends lifespan. If anything, it's got some some negativity. But in the short run, it's certainly helpful. There's no argument that it's going to help you build muscle, build you know repair tissue, this kind of thing. So it's a it's a yin yang. You don't get anything for free, right? And so what I would say is what I do, which is I do eat meat. I like to eat meat. I eat meat when I'm building muscle. So if I've just worked out or I'm going to work out or my muscles are particularly sore, I'm fine eating meat. But when I'm not in those states, I will do my best to only eat a plant-based diet if possible. And right, so that way my body is getting the benefits of both actually. The other thing that I mentioned is that it's not the only way to longevity. There's a whole network, a survival network, this longevity network of genes that mTOR is part of. And the other pillars of this network are AMP kinase, which will be activated by that drug metformin, and then the sirtuins, which we've worked on for over 20 years. And they all talk to each other. So it, it turns out if you activate the sirtuins, and you can do that many ways in the lab, turn on the gene, give them resveratrol or some other types of activators. You'll also be turning on AMP kinase and you'll be inhibiting mTOR. And so it is possible, I think, to be able to get the benefits of mTOR inhibition even when you're eating a meat-containing diet. Very interesting. Now, there's something you know, just to kind of acknowledge that what you're doing makes a lot of sense, right? Evolutionarily, when would you have eaten meat? Well, probably when you had finished a hunt, right? It wouldn't have been um, every day. It would have been after some, some maybe potentially vigorous activity and you would have consumed a great amount of meat and then you may not have meat for three or four days again, right? And then in between you would have been cons- consisting, your diet would have been consisting of plants. It makes a lot of sense. So I'd love to get into this dynamic between AMPK, sirtuins, and mTOR because I don't, I don't think it's very well understood. And I know you're doing an incredible job of, of explaining how this works and how these things work. And I think, first of all, maybe explaining what sirtuins are because I don't know that all my audience would know what those things are. Most people would have heard of AMPK and mTOR. I, I'm sure I rambled about that at some point with myself or one of the guests. But I'd also I'd love for you to describe those as well because, again, having a great understanding of those is always a useful skill or tool in the tool belt. Yeah. Well, let's just get mTOR and AMP kinase off the table or get beyond that. So mTOR, for those of you who don't know, is a protein complex. It's a sensor in the body in every cell that senses how much protein in the form of amino acids in the body. And the signal there, it needs to exist because if you have a lot of protein, the body can use that to build up more tissue if you don't have enough amino acids, your body would rather conserve them and not build up more tissue. So it's this sensor of input of protein. AMP kinase, similar concept. It's instead of sensing amino acids, it's sensing how much energy your body has available. AMP kinase will be activated by hunger. It'll be activated by low chemical energy in the body in the form of ATP. ATP is the chemical that our bodies use to pass energy around the body, basically our battery. Packs. So those two things are very important. They're sensing what we eat and how much energy we have available. The third part 
these sirtuins are super interesting. Okay, so sirtuins, they sense amino acids, they sense energy. And the way they do that is there's a molecule that they absolutely need to work, and it's called NAD. That's the short form of nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And NAD's levels go up with exercise, they go up with uh, hunger, but they're also high when you're young. And we think over time, we lose that NAD abundance for reasons we don't fully understand. Part of it seems to be that our bodies don't make as much, but also degrades the NAD for, for reasons that are really unclear and don't actually make a lot of sense. So NAD is, what is NAD? Uh, you might remember it from high school biology, but promptly forgot about it because it's such a boring molecule typically in, in class. NAD is used by the body for reactions. Uh, it's what's used by mitochondria to make more energy. About 500 enzymes in the body use NAD. NAD is actually existing in our bodies just to carry hydrogen around and donate it to other chemicals. It's not a very exciting molecule on its own. But what was discovered by our lab and Lenny Garenti's lab, where I was working at the time, deserves a huge shout out for being arguably the first lab to discover this, that NAD is also used as a sensor of the bo- by the body as to what we're doing with our lives. If we're hungry, if we're exercising, NAD levels will go up. And now these sirtuins will do a better job of protecting our body against diseases and aging. So how do we know what the sirtuins are doing and why they're important? Well, there's been a lot of research. We first discovered them as longevity genes in yeast cells, in baker's yeast and brewer's yeast. If you put more of the sirtuin gene into those yeast cells, they live about 30% longer. We have seven of those genes in our body. They have names that go from SIRT1 all the way to SIRT7. And you can think of these sirtuins as the genes make proteins. These enzymes are acting like traffic policemen, traffic cops in the cell saying, you guys or you, you girls go out and fix that. You over here, you go and protect the body or and you go and, I guess, deplete the body of fat. You go and repair the DNA. There's hundreds of roles of these sirtuins. They're, they're required for life. They're protecting the body all the time. And without them, we'd probably be dead pretty quickly in a matter of hours, probably. But they don't do their job unless the NAD levels in our body remain relatively high. It's based on a lot of observations, but essentially, the more NAD we give an animal or the more sirtuin genes we put into an animal, the healthier they are from their brain through to their skin to their liver. Uh, There's hundreds of studies now showing that this is true for animals and some pretty good evidence that is true for humans as well. For example, if you look at the genes for SIRT1 or SIRT6, they have variants, right? We all have different variations of these genes in our bodies. They're slightly different letters. There are certain combinations of letters in those genes that predict whether somebody's going to be resistant to heart disease or to Alzheimer's. And I saw a recent study that should be coming out soon that even predicts how long people are going to live in China. And so that's pretty good evidence that NAD is good and the sirtuins are good and that more is better. And we haven't actually seen any major concerns or downsides to having more NAD or more sirtuin activity. It all seems to be protective. And then I'll finally say that the sirtuins are very ancient. They're in yeast cells, they're in plants, they're in every animal. The reason that I think they exist is to sense when times are tough and protect the body so that we can survive. And if we activate them constantly, say every day we're hungry or we do some exercise, the body will be more robust, better built, and longer lasting. Amazing. Now, have we exhausted the kind of list of things that will influence sirtuins? So just to summarize, it sounds like sirtuins are almost these master regulator genes. Uh, and then we ultimately have these influences, whether it be environmental or dietary, that can impact the activation, I guess, and the proliferation or, or transcription maybe of the sirtuin genes. Has the list been exhausted? Has everyone done a lot of research in the realm of 
what are the best practices? So, I mean, you've mentioned a, f- a couple of time restricted feeding, exercise, cold, and heat exposure. Are those the primary ones that we know as far as exhaustive ways to impact sirtuins? I guess NAD as well, or is there still a lot more research being done in that area? Well, th- those are the main ones. There's still a lot to learn. You know, it's it's hard to know what we don't know, but I think w- anything that is thought to improve our health is on the table. There are a couple of things I want to mention that you didn't. One is that we can activate the sirtuin enzymes by eating certain molecules. Okay, resveratrol was the the first one that we published back about 14 years ago. That one comes from the plant world. It's found in red wine, of course, but resveratrol is one of a class of molecules called polyphenols that most scientists, in my view, incorrectly think are good for us because they're antioxidants. They're actually pretty terrible antioxidants. What they're actually doing, in my view, is turning on the body's natural defenses by directly binding to and turning on the activity of of the sirtuin enzymes. And we understand this in great, great detail. In fact, in my lab, we've been able to show precisely at the atomic level, actually, how resveratrol and some other plant molecules bind to the enzyme and turn it on and make it more active. When we first discovered it, by the way, it was considered ludicrous. Um, Most people couldn't believe that a plant molecule could activate an enzyme, certainly not the type of enzyme we're talking about here. And there was a lot of skepticism. Now that debate is completely over. Anyone who, who says resveratrol is controversial hasn't been reading the scientific literature lately. So what does that mean? Why would we respond to plant molecules in our diet? It turns out that, I guess it's still a hypothesis, but what I think is going on is that we are sensing our food supply as to whether it's abundant or it's going to run out. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because we didn't always have a brain. Uh, We didn't know that our food supply might run out. What we needed to do was to sense the chemicals in the food that we're consuming. And when plants are are at risk of dying, let's say that they're running out of water or they've just been exposed to a lot of light or have a, a fungal attack or an insect is eating it, or it's been damaged by, who knows what, an elephant, they actually will make these polyphenols in much more abundance in an effort, I think, to to survive because they need to turn on their own sirtuins. So plants have sirtuins as well. But we, I think, have evolved to sense that stress in our food supply. Now, there's one other thing that's really interesting. It's just been reported in a scientific paper that came out about three weeks ago that there's a molecule that works just like resveratrol. In fact, works identically to activate SIRT1 by binding to it and making it more active. And the molecule is called oleic acid. It's a monounsaturated fatty acid or a MUFA. It may ring a bell. It is the fatty acid that you can find in foods that are already known to be healthy, such as avocados and olive oil. But what's also curious, in fact, I think it's fascinating, is that when we're hungry, we all know we break down our fat, our white adipose tissue. One of the main products of that are these fatty acids, oleic acid, for example. So here's what I think is going on, that we have a few ways to sense when times are tough. And the sirtuins have evolved to sense that. One is they're measuring NAD levels. And NAD, as I mentioned, is the fuel for these enzymes to protect us. That's one. The second is that when we're hungry, the sirtuins can tell because the oleic acid that's coming out of our fat is turning it on. It says, okay, times are tough. We're hungry. Let's protect the body. And the third way is if we're eating stressed out plants that are likely to be dying in the future, those polyphenols are hitting exactly the same signal as our degrading fat would do. To me, it explains A, why certain foods are good for us, you know, red wine and olive oil. No coincidence that these have been figured out by others are healthy for us and why fasting is good for us as well. So there's my summary of what the sirtuins are all about and why they're good to know about. So incredibly useful. Thank you, David. Now, there's been some, you know, be back and forth. I know you kind of mentioned this a little bit. There's been some back and forth as to whether or not resveratrol is actually the anti-aging longevity 
molecule that maybe was originally thought when it came out. So your stance on that is still that it is really, really a strong activator of CERT1 and thereby a necessity in anyone's longevity protocol. Well, those are two different questions and they have two different answers. The first would be, what about this controversy? Well, you know, we scientists like to argue over minutiae. It's <laughs> what we do. True story. Yeah. And what we uh, published in a Nature paper 2003 was that resveratrol, when added to the CERT1 enzyme in a test tube, will activate its activity, turn on its activity. And that was great. We, we showed that resveratrol given to yeast and worms and flies and mice protected them from aging and protected them from a bad Western diet. And in fact, those those organisms were, as far as we could tell, mimicking fasting and caloric restriction. But what happened in 2010 was that a couple of companies, Amgen and, uh, and scientists at Pfizer, came out with a couple of papers that said that that's wrong, that if you add resveratrol to the enzyme in a test tube, it doesn't activate. That was a tough time, three years of trying to figure out what's going on, why is it questioned? Why did they say it was wrong? Basically, they said it works in only some circumstances. And if it only works under some circumstances in the test tube, then it cannot be true. Whereas my stance was the mere fact that it works under any circumstances is pretty amazing. And let's try to figure out why it doesn't always work depending on the conditions. And maybe that's telling us what is happening in, in the body. And what we discovered was a couple of things, and this is now well rested in the scientific literature, that the reason it doesn't work in every case is that the enzyme doesn't just willy-nilly go and work on every protein in the cell. It actually has a signature that it's looking for. So there are proteins in our body that, that are important for health and longevity. One is called FOXO. Another one is called PGC1-alpha. They have a particular signature that the enzyme is looking for. And the scientists at these companies didn't realize that the enzyme is a lot smarter than they gave it credit for. And it really wasn't working because they were giving it the wrong protein to act on. The other thing we did was we were able to actually show how it works. We could change just one amino acid in the enzyme and now resveratrol didn't work anymore. And that was because that amino acid in the protein was at the elbow and then now the protein couldn't give itself a hug and that's required for it to be active. And now we actually have a mouse that lacks that one amino acid in the enzyme and that's the only difference between it and its brothers and sisters. And now when we give that mouse or those mice, the mutant mice, resveratrol and a high fat diet, they don't live longer, whereas the, the ones that are normal do, which is a remarkable finding, right, that you can change one amino acid in one protein amongst the 25,000 that, that they produce. And that's enough to block the effect of a plant molecule that you give to an animal. So that's a long-winded answer to say, you know, I'll stand behind my signs any day. I'm very confident about that. You know, I'm usually a very humble guy, but when you start questioning my science about resveratrol that I've worked on my whole life, I'll definitely stand up for it. Well, good. Sorry, and the flip side of that is good that people are challenging it too, right? I mean, I'm sure as a scientist, you want people to say, hey, like, what did you think about this, right? P poking holes in the argument just so then you're forced to almost substantiate it and know that it's solid or, or something you can throw away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think anybody looking from the outside would say it was a good thing. And in the arc of science and the arc of my life, sure, it was a good thing. But when this happens to you and you can't get grant funding and people don't come to work with you anymore... Yeah. It's distressing, right? And you take it personally. And I can tell you, I, I, I said a few swear words um, back then. But <laughs> in the long run, of course, it's better. We were forced to do experiments that we normally would have never done. I would never have made these mutant mice if I hadn't been forced to. On the other hand, I could have been doing something maybe even more productive. But still, you're right that it is important in science for people to feel free to question conclusions. And in fact, as I wrote in, in my book, that we should assume that all science is wrong and that it'll eventually be overturned. Even Newton and Einstein, many of their theories were overturned too. So we shouldn't take it so personally. But what was a little bit galling about it for me was that we had a lot of evidence in my lab internally that said we were right. 
So I, if I was wrong, that's fine. It, it's not such a crime to be wrong as a scientist. We did our best. But I, I had a lot of belief that we were right. And then for about three years, I had to go around with my head hung low because everyone was looking at me like, oh, there's the scientist that got it wrong. Whereas deep down, I knew most likely we were right. So, you know, this is not a psychiatrist session, but I thought it'd be interesting for people to hear what it's like to be a scientist on the world stage and how it feels when you get challenged. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I get the idea of trying to raise money and, and funding and that's a challenging world, right? Like everyone's out there fighting for the same small pool of money and you know your previous data and previous research and, and publishing is going to determine whether or not you get it. So it's awesome to hear and see you having overcome that. So moving along, coming back to this molecule metformin, I think most people want to understand how it works. And now there's been data that comes out and says, oh, you shouldn't do it. It's going to be potentially causing cancer, maybe? Where is your current belief in with respect to metformin? Is it just exactly as you said? You don't obviously need it in youth and, and depending on your health and mid-age, you may or may not need it. And as you get older, it may be something that is a better lever for you to pull. Yes. So just to finish on resveratrol, I think that taking resveratrol in high doses doesn't seem to be harmful. And it's also in animals, at least it's anti-cancer. There's, there's no evidence that I'm aware of in hundreds of studies in animals and in people that it's actually bad bad for you at reasonable doses. So I take every morning a teaspoonful. So that that's not a mega dose. I wouldn't say go take 10 grams. That could damage your kidneys, so be careful. But in low doses over a long time. So what's that? And maybe with a glass. What's that? How much is in a teaspoon? Yeah. I've never weighed it. That you know it's shame on me for not being accurate. But I, I'm estimating it's about a gram. Okay. Yeah, I have a, a big bucket of it in my basement, so I just spoon it into a little bit of yogurt in the morning. Um, but yeah, it's a question of dosage and timing. I agree with critics who say resveratrol is not a great drug. It's not going to cure diabetes. There are, however, human studies now that have been done well. People have been given resveratrol in food so that it can be absorbed. And those people do have lower blood sugar after a few months and lower inflammation, just like we were seeing in, in the, the mouse studies that we did. So I just want to get that also out there because some early studies worked with resveratrol for lowering blood sugar and some didn't. But I think looking at the data, my view is that if you just take resveratrol on an empty stomach with a glass of water, it's not likely to get into the body. We know that's true in mice. Um, it seems to be true in people. And that might explain why sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't in humans. But shall we go to metformin now? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So I'm, I'm not the world's expert in metformin. I was a collaborator on the, the mouse study that showed that it extended a mouse's lifespan. So that's my disclaimer slash claim to fame. But I do know how to read scientific studies and I do know many of the world's experts as friends. So I talk a lot about it. So here's what I think. In the scientific literature, there are a couple of papers, both of which I cite in my book, that convinced me to start taking metformin, even though I didn't yet have type 2 diabetes, which is what it's prescribed for. Now, my calculation was the following. If those studies are correct, metformin is suppresses certain types of cancer, it lowers the rate of heart disease, frailty, and Alzheimer's, and of course, protects you from type 2 diabetes. That's all good. And I've looked at this data. It's very convincing. There's over 100,000 people that have been looked at. And people who have type 2 diabetes who take metformin actually have lower risk of those diseases than people who don't have type 2 diabetes and, of course, were not prescribed metformin. So that's really strong evidence. The other thing that convinced me to take it was that my blood sugar was increasing as I got older. I'm monitoring myself more than most people would with blood tests. And I didn't want to get type 2 diabetes. And my father was borderline type 2 diabetes. He's on metformin. And my attitude to medicine is if it's a cheap drug, if it's got no apparent serious side effects, and it's going to protect me against diseases, at least has a good chance of doing it, I'm going to try it. You know, I know what's going to happen if I don't, and that's not pretty at all. And I also think that it's our moral imperative to keep ourselves healthy as long as we can. And I've taken care of a parent who was sick for 20 years 
thanks to smoking and lung cancer. You know, as much as I love my mother, that was not a responsible way to treat her family, let alone herself. So that's where I'm on metformin. I think that in terms of the downsides, there's a little bit of muscle growth inhibition, even though the strength is still there. The upside is that it's anti-inflammatory and seemingly anti these diseases of aging. And I know that AMP kinase is key and that I can't always be hungry and I can't always be exercising the way I want because I'm busy doing other things. And I think that metformin is a close substitute for doing those things. I did an experiment where I, I took it for 30 days in the morning and saw actually a pretty significant decrease in my performance. And then I took it for 30 days before bed and uh, didn't see the same decrease in performance. Any thoughts there as far as timing and dosage? That's great. Okay. I'm glad you told me that. I didn't realize that that was seemingly the right thing to do, but it makes a lot of sense that, yeah, if you're working out, you know, I don't take metformin on days I work out because metformin will reduce the free radical production that is part of the process to be able to build muscle. So you're exactly right. It, in my view, that is that if you want to get the benefits, you have to time things correctly. And it sounds like a great solution. Yeah, so taking it at night, I think I'm going to try that and see how it works out for me. But though, Ben, most most people aren't as worried about performance as you. You know, 99% of the planet uh, is unfit anyway. But I guess uh, the, the people listening to this in general are very focused on fitness. So we want to we do want to get into the well, details. And I think for me, it actually made me feel less energetic. Like I didn't feel like I was as enthusiastic and my body just didn't feel as vigorous. So like that even took away from the likelihood of me wanting to work out, right? When I wake up in the morning and I feel vital and I'm full of energy and, and vigor, like I want to go to the gym. My testosterone is flowing and I feel enthusiastic about it. And that felt like it almost, I mean, you know, taking me from a nine to a seven kind of thing as far as my perceived desire to go and actually do something strenuous. And I think that's a big deal. Like if, you know, the overall sense of malaise, if we take that away from somebody and give them some fear in their life, maybe they'll feel more enthusiastic about sex and walking and running and, and exercise. And I think that even that little lever may be a useful thought. Well, you must know your body incredibly well, right? Because you're, you're just one person, but you're coming up with answers that are basically found by scientists who study many dozens of people. A case in point, there was a paper that I came across recently that showed that metformin reduces the incentive to work out by altering, I forget which chemical in the brain, it might have been serotonin, but I definitely remember reading that metformin may actually have reduced muscle size, not just because of its biochemical effects on the muscle, but because of people's desire to push themselves in the gym. Oh, well, good. I guess I'm, I'm not crazy that I'm on the right track. <laughs> One more thing I wanted to mention or I wanted to bring up is this molecule rapamycin, and you brought that up briefly, and another potential pharmaceutical people could be looking at and maybe just giving us a little bit of breakdown as to what that is and how it works. Yeah, so rapamycin is a molecule that is used as a drug to suppress the immune system. If you're a transplant patient, you'll, you'll get this at high doses. A high dose would be over 10 milligrams. Now, the thought is that if you take a low dose and you don't take it every day, a low dose being, for example, one milligram, two milligrams, maybe even three milligrams, that you won't have the suppression of your immune system, but you'll have the benefit. And we mentioned mTOR earlier, right? So M rapamycin will mimic low amino acids and inhibit mTOR. And rapamycin has worked in many animal studies to increase lifespan. And in dogs, it looks like it improves the heart function as well. Well, why don't I take rapamycin? Well, there are a couple of reasons. I'll, I'll tell you honestly, you know, I'm, I'm sworn to truth as a scientist. So I'll tell you exactly why I don't take rapamycin. One is that I don't have free access to it. It's not like I can just call up somebody and get it. It's, it's hard to get. Second is it's increasingly expensive. And the third reason is that out of all the molecules that I have or could get access to, it's the one that has the most chance of having side effects, right? We actually know that rapamycin can have a negative impact, say, on your kidneys. And I'm also busy. So that's the fourth point is that, you know, I'm not sitting around trying to extend my lifespan. I'm a scientist trying to earn a living. So put that all together. What does it mean? It means that it probably would help there's some risk to it, 
in terms of long-term dosage. But I also think that it has a lot of promise given that rapamycin is the most potent longevity molecule that's ever been seen in the lab. Very interesting. So from an outsider's perspective, kind of shifting gears again, inflammation seems to be the biggest lever I can see as a relative amateur here with respect to longevity. Like how would you uh, rate inflammation levels in the body with respect to its impact on first longevity in general, but then maybe its impact on my thought going down the path of if I have elevated inflammation, is it going to negatively impact my body's ability to respond to these other modalities? Like, is it impacting my sirtuins ability to respond or is it going to negatively impact my body's ability to have the positive benefit from metformin and resveratrol? Yeah. Well, there there are two things that we need to separate. One is your immune activity and the other is inflammation, chronic inflammation. You want the first one. You want to be able to resist viruses, the flu, uh, infections, but you do not want a hyperactive, constantly alert immune system. That's We call that inflammaging, and that is really bad. If you want to measure or figure out roughly how long you're going to live, just look at how much interferon, TNF-alpha, is in your bloodstream. And if it's continuously high, either you're very old or you're getting older really quickly. And I'll give you an example of why it's bad to have chronic inflammation besides the obvious, which is your your body just doesn't respond well to all sorts of insults. The best example I can give is that if you induce inflammation in a cell, what we've discovered is that it actually depletes the cell of NAD. And you'll all recall that you need NAD for your sirtuins to protect the body. So chronic inflammation is going to make your body less long-lived, in part because it's turning off your body's defenses against aging in the first place. And there are you know, plenty of ways to, to have chronic inflammation by what we eat and how much we eat. The worst thing you can do is to have a lot of adiposity or fat on your body. We've studied Western diets in animals, in mice and rats for decades now, including in my lab. And we clearly see that being overweight and also sedentary lifestyle, but even more important, being overweight and having high amounts of blood sugar promotes inflammation throughout the animal's body. And an obese animal won't just get more diseases like diabetes and cancer, it literally will be older. You're actually accelerating your aging process by being overweight. So anyone who is listening, who you know isn't in tip-top shape, isn't trim, tr- try your best to, to shed those pounds because you'll have inflammation and you will literally be ticking your clock faster. Very interesting. So another topic that comes up very often with respect to uh, longevity is telomeres. And I've heard you talk on telomeres saying they may not be as indicative of longevity as we believed originally. And now there's this new molecule, I believe it's CD38, that is in maybe a little bit more indicative of actual lifespan. Can you talk about that a little bit? So CD38 is an enzyme that degrades NAD and it comes on as, as animals get older, probably when we get older too, we've had a look in human blood samples and we see a lot of CD38 come on. Having a lot of CD38 is bad and there's a thought that if we can block it, We'll have more NAD for our sirtuins to protect us. There's at least a couple of companies working on that right now. Yeah, so that that's CD38. What was the other part to your question, Ben? Telomeres. Oh, yeah, telomeres. Forgive me. I've been on planes for the last few weeks. <laughs> All right, we're so deprived. It's a side effect of jet lag, though. NAD, by the way, is what controls your circadian rhythms and CERT1 uh, downstream. Oh. And so one of the, the things that I do for jet lag is to boost my NAD in the morning, which seems to help me at least get over a lot of the jet lag. So yeah, can try that, see how how you all go. But telomeres, now I'm not, first of all, saying telomeres have nothing to do with, with aging. Not at all. What I'm saying is that they're not the main cause of aging. So there are what are called the hallmarks of aging, which is really a, a way of saying, scientists to say that these are things that likely are underlying the aging process. And telomeres are, or telomere shortening is one of those processes. There are lots of others. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. There's loss of stem cells. 
nutrient deregulation, DNA damage. But there's one in particular in that circle that I think is possibly more important than all of the others in that list, including telomere shortening. And that is epigenetic changes over time. And so, you know, telomeres are important. Let me just finish the story about telomeres. We lose telomeres as we get older and lengthening them seems to be helpful in mice for reasons that are not fully understood because mice don't have very short telomeres to begin with. But long telomeres seems to help them, possibly because those telomeres are affecting the epigenome that I was just mentioning. So often I'm asked, should people take telomere or telomerase activators? So molecules that would turn on telomerase and extend telomeres. So I don't know the answer to that, and I certainly don't recommend molecules to take as a PhD. But I think that the concern about the harm that you could do to your body by having long telomeres is less evident. We used to think that having long telomeres would cause cancer because having short telomeres was thought to be a cancer suppression mechanism. The fears are less because there there hasn't been a lot of evidence that if you extend telomeres in animals that they get cancer. But are they going to make you live a lot longer? You know, I remain unconvinced at this point, ambivalent, put it that way. I think it's possible. And it's particularly possible for organs that divide a lot, the cells divide a lot, like the liver and the skin, or the lining of blood vessels where the body is always trying to produce new cells. And cell division is one of the main processes that erodes the telomeres, the ends of chromosomes. So it's part of the story. But I also think that there are ways to naturally turn on telomerase. I think that this epigenetic mechanism that I'm a big fan of may be part of the the whole story that we should be able to turn on telomerase naturally by resetting the cells by epigenetic information and so that they behave as though they're young. And literally, if you measure the age of the cells, they will be young again. Well, that opens up a big can of worms because epigenetics and obviously genetic or DNA damage is, is a big area of, of interest of mine, but I'm certain that most of our listeners would not have any clue what things are, are negatively or impacting their epigenetics and what things could be positively applied to their life to prevent negative implications around epigenetics or maybe positive, possibly turn on positive genes. So, I mean, I'm sure this long list of things that you've been mentioning already is certainly there. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Or maybe you could just first kind of explain epigenetic changes and maybe what our best levers are there to pull to optimize that and not you know see negative effects. Yeah. The simplest way to put it to start with is that our DNA is one form of information that our bodies need. But there's a second type of information, which is called the epigenome, which controls the DNA, right? Our our DNA isn't always available to the cell. You don't want a brain cell to be turning on the same genes as a skin cell or a liver cell. This epigenome that tells the skin cell to be a skin cell and read the genes for skin and the brain cell to do a different program. It's similar to how the DNA would be the computer and the epigenome would be the software. A lot of people have focused in on the loss of the genetic code, the DNA code, as a cause of aging. Um, and it's it's certainly true that we lose DNA and we lose the code as we get older. I'm not disputing that. But what my proposal is that the epigenome is more important, that the biggest change to our bodies is actually the ability to read the right genes at the right time. And that genetic information in the genome is still largely intact in the body, even when you're old. But the question is, how do we slow down the loss of the epigenome? How do we stop ourselves from losing their identity and their ability to read the right genes to maintain their function? And some of the things that I've said today are very likely to be things that slow that down. Now, the sirtuins are really central to that. At least three of them are in the nucleus protecting the DNA from this process, the loss of epigenetic information. In fact, information is a really important concept for aging. In fact, I think in years to come, you won't be able to talk about aging without using the word information. So we get information from our parents and we lose it over time because in part, our DNA is breaking all the time and that leads to a reorganization of which genes are turned on and off. And eventually our cells, for want of a better term, forget 
how they were originally assembled. But I want to highlight this word information because in the word Sirtuin is the letter I. The second letter in Sirtuin is I, and that stands for information. The full name of Sirtuins is Silent Information Regulator Number 2. That's where the T in the Tuin comes from. And we've known in yeast cells since the 1980s, early 90s, that Sirtuins, or the original gene called Sirtu in yeast, is controlling cell type. Of course, yeast don't have skin and liver and brain cells, but they do have cell type. They can be a male or a female, or what we would call an A or an alpha type of cell. And the Sirtuins regulate that. They tell a cell whether it's an A or an alpha. So that's their main job. They have another job, which is repairing broken DNA, which we also showed in a paper back in 1999. And it's this dual purpose of these sirtuins, controlling cell type by saying which genes should be on and off, and the other job, which is repairing broken DNA. Now, the problem for us, I think, is that every time a sirtuin gets distracted by broken DNA, it has to leave its post and it's sitting on the chromosomes, making sure the cell knows what type of cell it is, a skin cell, for example. But when the DNA becomes broken, the sirtuin is distracted. And after the repair of the DNA is complete, all of those sirtuin enzymes have to go back to where they came from. And what we've shown over the last decade is that they don't all go back to where they came from. So every time you break a chromosome of a skin cell, it's slightly losing its epigenome. It's lose, slowly losing its identity. It's not turning on the youthful genes the way it should. And so that accumulates over time. And we see this in yeast cells. We see it in, in mice. And I believe, therefore, it's true in humans. We're a lot closer to mice than mice are to yeast cells, that's for sure. And so that's the point, is that our sirtuins get distracted by DNA damage particularly double-stranded DNA breaks, which are the most dangerous, most potent form of DNA damage that we experience. But I think that by exercising, by taking these molecules that we talked about, NAD and resveratrol, we're giving our sirtuins an extra boost to be able to handle this dual activity that they're required to do. Ben, you asked me about what are the best ways to actually uh, slow that down. I think that maintaining that the the sirtuin activity is the best thing you can do right now. But we're working on something brand new that isn't yet available to us as humans, but we've done it to mice. And what we've done is we've instructed the cell to go back to its original epigenetic status. In other words, flipping the reset switch on the hard disk drive and reboot the software of the cell. And when we do that, the cells go back to turning on all the genes that they did when they were young and turning off the ones that they had off when they were young. And the cells that are old get back their identity and they work like they were young again. Wow, that's cool. Think there's a research in that in the lab? Yeah, we're hoping to publish this. Uh, we've sent it off to one of the world's best journals, which I won't name. But it's actually this paper. If anyone wants to read it, it's posted on a website called BioArchive. That's R X I V. And uh, you can read about it. We're just revising this paper now, so it's not yet fully peer-reviewed. We've gotten comments back, and they're favorable. What we've done is we've taken three genes that are normally switched on in embryonic development. They're called Yamanaka factors. And those three genes, which are called, for short, O, S, and K, somehow they flick the switch, and the cells turn their clock back. And the cells don't just act young. When we read how old they are, and we we know how to do that now, we can read their epigenome, they are literally young again. And the upshot of that is that we can actually treat an old mouse. And in the case of this paper that I'm talking about, we reset the eyeballs, and those old blind mice now can see like they were young again. Wow, super interesting. So one thing you said there was, you know, looking at this anti-aging 
and information synergy, I guess, or, or the necessity to have it in the conversation. So the first thing that my m- mind goes to, and this could be completely wrong, but I'd love for you to clarify, is protein folding, right? It is the, the you know, it's been a lot of talk around the misfolding of proteins as it relates to cellular regeneration, cellular health. And then I, my brain thinks of structured water. So is that correct? Like when I think of, you know, this, this misfold of proteins and DNA damage, are, are we heading down the right path? Is that the right thought? And have you guys looked at any implications of structured water around the cell or is that, is that just something that's not even on the level of impacting how the cells actually function? So structured water isn't in the field. It's not talked about. We haven't studied it. The opposite is true for protein misfolding. Protein misfolding is clearly a driver of aging. It's one of those hallmarks that I was talking about it's up there with telomere shortening and mitochondrial dysfunction. And fasting, especially long periods of fasting, will chew up uh, misfolded proteins that will accumulate as we get older, giving rise to aging as well as diseases like Alzheimer's. But if I'm to add anything new to the conversation about that, it's this, that we tend to think that Alzheimer's and the accumulation of these problems in our cells, like misfolded proteins, is a one-way street. Um, I'm increasingly of the belief that if we can activate our cells in the right way, and if we can turn back the clock the way I just described, then a lot of these processes, these hallmarks of aging that we once thought were impossible to reverse, are actually quite reversible. I'll give you just an example. If we took an Alzheimer's patient if we somehow had a way of now making the brain of that patient 20 years old again. Now, we can't do this today, but you know, as I said, we're getting at least a proof of concept that it could be doable. Is that person going to still have Alzheimer's disease? I would argue no, that the reason that it gets these diseases is because it's not youthful anymore and that the process of losing epigenetic information, the process of losing the software in our body makes us more susceptible to these hallmarks of aging, but much of it is more reversible than we once thought. And that's also why I think it it gives me hope that by being hungry occasionally and maintaining exercise is able to not just delay aspects of aging, but actually reverse some of them as well. Brilliant. And I think you're, you're certainly on the right track. That may be the most interesting thing I've heard in, in the space of longevity ever is because if we are going to reverse aging or ultimately optimize the ability to not age, it has to come in my eyes from a genetic level, right? The epigenetic genetic level. I mean, there has to be some type of reset to these genes and that just makes the most sense with this path that you're on right now. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that I've been very, very lucky to be to end up in my career, something that I love doing. I've been very lucky to make discoveries that, you know, have turned out to be followed and, and I guess, uh, part of the foundation of, of a whole field. That's, you know, good timing and a, a hell of a lot of work. But what I'm particularly thrilled about is that this discovery that you can flick the reset switch of an old cell and even something as complicated as an old eyeball is something... I didn't even dream of when I was a kid. That's science fiction kind of stuff. And so I've already surpassed what I was hoping to achieve in my lifetime. And, it, you know, I wake up every day thinking, not just am I lucky, but I'm in this position now of great responsibility to be able to get the science right and hopefully be part of a team that can can get the technology to people as well. Wonderful. So the one thing that I want to kind of wrap up is you spoke about this DNA breaks What are the main causes that are preventable or avoidable? Yeah, that's the right question. So it's unavoidable for the most part. A lot of DNA breaks are occurring in our bodies. There's at least a trillion throughout our body every day. That's the bad news. Even if we lived at the bottom of the ocean in a lead box, we'd still have DNA breaks. But there are things you can do to minimize DNA breaks. Now, the first thing is, make sure that your body is super primed for DNA repair. And I'm very much of the belief that our bodies know what they're doing. So it's far better to boost the body's natural defenses than to try and engineer around it. I guess I'm more more of a biologist than uh, engineer that way. So again, you want to boost your DNA repair systems in the body. 
Raising an AD, we've shown, we had a science paper a couple of years ago showing that raising an AD improves DNA repair. Many people know that. And there are a couple of key protein families. There are the PARP proteins called PARP. Yep, you probably have heard of those. So PARP1, you definitely want to keep active. It's a DNA repair protein. And then the SIRT2ones again, SIRT1 and SIRT6 are the key DNA repair proteins as well. So keep your NAD levels high. That's one way. How do you avoid DNA breaks? Well, you cannot have a lot of x-rays. X-rays will definitely break your chromosomes. I wouldn't refuse an x-ray if it was for a medical reason. But in my view, some x-rays are unnecessary. You know, I think every time I go to the dentist, it seems like they want to give me another x-ray. I tend to say only do it if it's really, really necessary. That's one. Don't get a lot of CT scans unless it's for a medical reason. CT scans will also damage your DNA and break it. And there are other things you can do. So there are chemicals in our world that we're eating and breathing that will lead to DNA breaks. Plastics, if you microwave them, there are a whole bunch of chemicals that get released. There are nitroso compounds, which are in cigarettes. They're in yellow dye of certain types. Inkjet printer, uh, the yellow, is a potent DNA uh, damaging agent. So these are the things to avoid as well. You know, people ask me about cell phones. I think it's fine. I haven't seen any issue with those. The body scanners that are at the airport. Yeah, I was going to mention that one. Now, I get a little bit silly when it comes to those scanners. I think scientifically, there's not a lot of reason to worry at this point. But let me qualify that statement. Those scanners used to cause DNA breaks. They've been replaced by ones that are uh, very weak millimeter scan machines. But there was a point when those scanners were presumably slightly accelerating our aging. That's that's my, my view. Today, I think that there's much less of a worry. But in an abundance of caution, just in case I try to avoid going through those scanners, I get in the US, there's TSA pre. So I try to get that uh, every time and not go through the scanners and get a pat down if, if I, I feel like I can be bothered. Now, there's no proof, but here's the, here's the caveat that it's never been tested. When people talk about DNA damage, they're worried about cancer. And of course, those scanners have been tested for their ability to mutate cells and cause cancer. But nobody's thinking the way that we've talked about today, that the epigenome is also potentially affected by radiation. Um, no one's ever put a mouse in a scanner to see what would happen. The closest that has come to that is research that we've done in my lab, where we've cut the DNA for a few weeks of a young mouse, let the DNA heal. And what we see is an acceleration of the aging clock. And those mice get older by 50%. And they get diseases much quicker, and they go gray, and they lose their hair and all that kind of stuff. Now, of course, the scanners aren't trashing the chromosome, but it does give me pause for thought, which is that maybe just a little bit of DNA damage is still going to have long-lasting consequences, especially if you fly as much as uh, the two of us do. Right. That's what I was going to say. Even just being in the air, I'm sure, is also another consideration as far as you know, oxidative stress and, and radiation. Right. Well, I like to take my NAD boosting molecule while I'm flying just to make sure that my DNA repair systems are super active during that. So the interesting uh, anecdote I'll tell you is I I refused to go through the scanner one time and the guy that was there, he's not a scientist, but he said, oh, don't worry. It's it's only as much radiation as you'll get in the air. And my thought was, why would I want to double my exposure? Totally. Right. Yeah. Is there anything else you do that's kind of a daily practice as far? I mean, if, you, if you're traveling, have you, have you experimented with it with the molecular hydrogen, uh, anything else to kind of mitigate these free radical or radiation exposures? Well, mostly it's the usual things I do daily, which is not eat a lot. So my body is, is hungry in the flight if I can help it. I take the NAD booster. Other than that, no, it's making sure I'm hydrated. And then when I land, I'll take another boost of uh, the NAD booster to reset my clock. But no, other than that, I mean, do, do you have any suggestions for 
air travel, how to make it more pleasant. Yeah, molecular hydrogen would be one that's been suggested to have a really great benefit. I know the whole biohacking community has dived into it. And there's a guy named Tyler LeBaron who now lives in Japan who's a researcher specific to hydrogen saying it's, it's one of the best ways to mitigate the oxidative stress. So the only question that I had remaining, obviously, I could sit and, and steal your time for many hours, but I highly suggest the audience go and get the book because obviously we can't download your brain in 60 minutes. The only question I had was there's been some people expressing that maybe NAD isn't ideal for people who are younger. And it kind of goes in line with what you're saying is like, hey, if you're younger, you already have these maybe abundant NAD systems, or is it your belief that it's beneficial for anyone at any age? There's always details. Let, let's go through it very briefly. So first first of all, thanks for mentioning my book. It reminds me to say that if you buy the book and you go to page 303, there's a cheat sheet. Of course, the audio book is not, not listed by pages, but all that information is in there if you want to just jump to the chase and, and not read about the interesting science or the stories behind what we're doing or you don't, you don't care about why it works, just tell me what to do. That's page 303. But yes, yeah, essentially, the things that I, that I do, that I list, have been personalized over the, the many years that I've been doing this, trying things out, measuring things. I do biomonitoring on a daily basis, blood pressure. I'm looking at my pulse. I'm looking at my blood readouts on a semi-regular regular basis, and I can see what's working with me at least, and what isn't. And so that's where I've come up with the, the 300, page 303 list of things. The book also talks about tricks of what to do if you're after certain goals. So intermittent fasting, what are the various types? So when activating molecules, various types. NAD boosters, various types. Let's just drill down to when and where to take NAD. Okay, that's a good place to go back to. NAD is probably high enough in a young person that it's not necessarily important to boost. That's an easy answer, but there's always a detail that's missing. The detail is that we gave young mice NMN, which is the immediate precursor to NAD, and we didn't see any effect. Okay, great. Everything's consistent. But then we exercised those mice, and guess what? The NMN was additive. Those mice ran further than the mice that didn't exercise on an endurance test. So if that's true for us, what it means is that if you're just sitting around and taking NAD and you're young, you don't get a benefit. But if it's true for humans, if you're exercising, it might enhance your endurance. Now, you know, the caveat is that mice are not humans, and that's always the main criticism extrapolating but you know these are all proof of principles and i think that it at least raises the possibility that nad boosters could help in certain situations absolutely fantastic dr sinclair i can't tell you how grateful i am for your time and maybe even more importantly for your commitment to helping us uh, demystify this vast space and continue to be a pioneer in the space and You've got a fan of me. I'm, I'm, I've read your book, and I look forward to everything that you put out. And I've definitely check out the bio archive site that you suggested, and I'll link to the show notes. Is there anything else you'd like to send out to our listeners, or anywhere you'd like to send them to learn more from you? Yeah, well, so I'm active on social media, and so when I see something that catches my attention every every day, I'm reading science, and if there's something exciting, I'll post that on Twitter or on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at uh, David A Sinclair. Instagram is David Sinclair PhD. I'm also the usual LinkedIn and, and other sites, Facebook as well. One thing that our listeners may not know is that I have a newsletter that uh, I write every month or so, and listeners can sign up for that. The place to sign up is called lifespanbook.com. So my book is called Lifespan. So that's pretty easy to remember. And, you know, I, I talk about topics that, that people tell me they want to hear about. What does my father do? What do I recommend? What about reprogramming? How soon will that be around for us to do? So that's the way I keep in touch and update what's in my book. There'd be an interesting thing to add to that. I think every every parent out there, David, is very concerned of like, hey, what are the best practices I could maybe have my children do? And, and not from a perspective of longevity, but maybe from a perspective of 
you know, resilience or anti-fragility and like making sure they're super healthy now. So their body becomes more resilient from a young age and, and better adapted to not be you know, subjected to all of these massive stresses as we, as we get older, obviously, you know, we want to create resilience in our kids. And if you think if you create a stronger foundation, then you send them into the world with maybe a better skill set and a better tool belt. And I think that would be an interesting thing. Just if you have any thoughts, I'm like, Hey, here's the best practices. And, I, and I'm sure it would be all sim- simple stuff, but I think sometimes parents need to hear it. And if we're ultimately going to change the direction of the human species, it starts with the youth. So I'd love to have you contribute something like that. And I'll definitely be a subscriber of that newsletter. Right. I will write about it. Let me say what, what's on the tip of my tongue that, that I'm going to write about. It's a hot topic about trying to make sure your kids are healthy. What most parents don't appreciate is that the lifestyle of their kids and what they're exposed to when they're very young, even in the womb, will dictate their future health. And that's because the epigenome, the software, is written during those times. And it will be with your children for the rest of their lives. And so there are really interesting studies that say what a mother eats during pregnancy. For example, avocados full of this special fatty acid that activates CERT1, that is thought to improve the health of your child for the long term. Similarly, if you're obese, it actually does negatively impact your children if you're pregnant at the time. And no question if your child is obese during childhood, it will set them up for long-term health problems. And I'll tell you a really quick story that there's a disease called TTD, which is a type of premature aging. And there was nothing you could do for these kids. They lose their hair, they can barely sit up. And one scientist rebelled and said, why don't we try caloric restriction? Why don't we not feed them all the time? Because that's what the doctors were recommending. Feed, feed, feed. That's the way to keep kids healthy. Instead, he was allowed to restrict their food quite severely, right? So the kids are still quite hungry because the parents were desperate. No parent wants their kid to be hungry, right? But that they had no, no other alternative. Those kids started sitting up. They started responding. I've seen videos of this. It's, I wouldn't say miraculous, but it, 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 that's a good word to describe it. We don't ever consider allowing our kids to be hungry because we're, we're basically told that that's criminal. But I'm more and more of the belief that we're slowly killing our kids and setting them up for a disease-filled life by always keeping them fed. Yeah, and also become making them consumers, right? They, they think now the solution to all your stress and your problems and those internal pains that you get is, well, I need to consume something. And that's just driving more of this materialism. And, and, and you know, if not- you've never felt hungry in your life, it's going to be a shock when it comes about. So, But it's hard. I'm a, I'm a parent of three, and I have – two girls that are thin, in one case, though too thin. So it's it's really hard. And then in the case of our third child, they overeat. And it's the same household, same snacks in the cupboard, and it just manifests its, itself very differently in, in these individuals. And one recipe, you know, one solution isn't, isn't going to work for the other child. It's a challenge. You know, it's, it's easy to say, it's another thing to do. Yeah, I think that would be a huge, hugely valuable addition to your newsletter because most parents are, I mean, at least I believe most parents have the best interest of their offspring in mind and want their child to be optimized and flourish. And, and some little things, I know, we, like as you're saying, as simple as a little bit of caloric restriction, maybe once a week could vastly improve the resilience of their epigenetic expression. So uh, any of those little tips like that, I know a lot of your audience would be Really, really grateful for us, but I. Sure. Yeah. Well, th- let me say one thing. It's not just what you eat, it's when you eat. I'm not saying to make your kids go hungrier, but I'm saying that this old idea that you need three square meals a day plus snacks has to be thrown out the window. Thank you. I appreciate that so much, David. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honor and a privilege. Ben, it's been great to be on. Thanks for having me. That's a wrap, ladies and gents. I hope you enjoyed the podcast with Dr. David Sinclair. Absolute brilliant, brilliant individual, a wealth of information. I love the fact that he is a thought leader. This guy's not following anybody, and it's so challenging in our society right now, it seems, to not follow the crowd, to stand out and to have your own thought process, to get outside of the box, as I talk about so often. My 
honor to speak with Dr. Sinclair. It just keeps getting emphasized because of all the stuff that he continues to put out since we've recorded the podcast. And ultimately for the last X number of years, he's been just an absolute leader in this longevity space. And hopefully you guys have some desire to first optimize your body, optimize your mind, and then ultimately let's all live a long, healthy, strong, vibrant, vital life with love in your heart. Have an amazing day. And don't forget to check out bubsnaturals.com to get hooked up with 20% off your order of collagen and MCT powder, both of which are massively essential, whether on a ketogenic diet or if you just eat a fair amount of animal protein. I highly suggest you use the code intelligence at bubsnaturals.com. Have a great day. Live your greatest life in a body you love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.